We'll be right back. It's the Jeff Santo Show. MTC rocking in the 206. We'll be back with MTC. This is the Jeff Santo Show. It is the Jeff Santo Show that you are tuned into. Coming to you live from the South Coast here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We uh, travel on Interstate 90 all the way across the country, 3,000 miles. It uh, was a long run, but we made it because we are now in the 206 with the great MTC, Mark Taylor Canfield. You can check him out, Democracy Watch News. You can check him out here every Friday on the Jeff Santos Show. And you can listen to him once you get into Seattle, uh, throughout uh, Capitol Hill, Pioneer Square, and every other great location. Uh, his band's playing, and uh, there's a lot of music being uh, taken into uh, by the great people of Seattle. And, uh, of course, the bands that uh, made it there in the 90s uh, with Dave Grohl and Eddie Vedder and all that, uh, they're there, too, of the Black Tones, too. Uh, Mark Taylor Canfield joins us, and with some interesting news on the labor front as well. MTC, great to have you on, my friend. How are you? Well, I'm doing good, Jeff. Uh, we're out on the inland waters of the Salish Sea, uh, which I've never really explained to your listeners. But Oh, by the way, I just flew in from Boston, and boy, are my arms tired. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> well, you know, it is, it is a long run. Yeah. Yeah, we've been on the, that's an old one. We've been in inland waters of the Salish Sea, and when I say that, um, all the lakes and the river um, networks are connected to Elliott Bay and Puget Sound, which is the Salish Sea. So uh, when I say inland waters of the Salish Sea, that could mean uh, the Montlake Cut or the canals or Lake Union or Lake Washington or uh, the Sammamish River or Lake Sammamish because they're all connected. So it's a beautiful place to go boating or go kayaking or canoeing because you can just head out and go, you know, literally hundreds of miles, and it's all connected. Of course, to get from the inland waters to the Puget Sound and Elliott Bay in Seattle, you have to go through the Ballard Locks. So, uh, like other folks who have been on maybe the canals in, in New York, um, they know what I'm talking about. There are locks that uh, you have to go through because the inland waters are actually um, above sea level. So you have to go step, they have to step you down in order to get into Elliott Bay. And then, so then it goes from fresh water to seawater. So, but occasionally the seals, you know, the sea lions come in to the fresh water anyway. And I've seen some really big fish jumping in Lake Union and that's an urban uh, center. I mean, that's where Boeing was building its seaplanes back in the day. And I've seen some big fish jumping out here, Jeff. So I don't know what they are. Uh, sometimes I think they might be some kind of big trout or salmon or something, but they're definitely large fish. But um, I did, unfortunately, I did hear a report about the oil spill in California, and I, I was just, it was just irking me. I had to, like, kind of say something out loud to the people around me about this news report that said that, oh, oh, the, the oil company says that um, no more than 120,000 gallons of oil were spilled, so don't worry, it's fine. It was only 120,000 gallons. Yeah, and that, how many people? How many? How many people are affected? How many fish are affected? How many sea level sea life is affected? It's and and, and the environmental catastrophe that it is outrageous. What's happening in Southern California, man, is out of control. Fuel. Out of fossil we fuels, 100. percent No, yeah, you're, you're spot labor, on. Uh, yeah, big you, victories you there. To, to ask me about that. Yeah. Uh, um, the carpenters have, uh, they finally sat down at the table with the developers and the contractors because this affects uh, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, a lot of the biggest names in corporate, uh, in international corporate affairs. Uh, they're trying to build developments, corporate headquarters and the like in Seattle, these towers. They're not exactly skyscrapers, but they call them towers because they're not as tall as skyscrapers, but they're large. And so they're building all over the city, and then the carpenters' union went on strike, so we were out in front on Democracy Watch News and on the Jeff Santos show on this issue long before most of the corporate media because they hadn't really done the, the background work or I interviewed the union members about what was really going on and the inside story. But unfortunately, it became sort of a almost a Shakespearean uh, drama or something at one point where you had even some union uh, leadership uh, kind of dissing their own membership that wanted to go on strike, and then there were accusations of red baiting going on. What is this, the McCarthy era again? I don't know. Here we go. Yeah, uh, there were all sorts of things going on, heated conversations and words, and then finally they sat down at the table on uh, Tuesday and way into the night negotiated. By Wednesday morning, they came up with something that they're calling a tentative agreement, and it does give 
the carpenters ten dollars more an hour over a three year uh, period. Oh, we have a seaplane coming over. Excuse me for that. Uh, but they were asking for fifteen dollars more per hour because it is very expensive. As one of their main uh, complaints was that it was uh, not affordable for them to live in Seattle. That they weren't making enough wages to live in the city where they work. This ha- actually did um, affect two thousand carpenters, Northwest uh, Carpenters Union workers across the region, though. So not just in Seattle, but across the state. They did get ten dollars an hour in this tentative agreement instead of fifteen over three years. They also got some of the parking fees, you know, taken care of. So the property owners or the developers are going to have to start taking care of that, which is was one of the major complaints. Because as you know, living in, a, in in any major city in the United States, parking is very expensive. Very it's expensive. basically very expensive to have a car. So when you're t- commuting into the city where you can't afford to live, and then you have to pay, you know, seventy five bucks a, a day or whatever to park your car, it gets outrageously stupid. So the Carpenters Union and Arthur. Um, Esparza, who was the the main kind of uh, uh, spearhead in this in this uh, strike movement, they have actually d- given a tentative agreement to the Associated General Contractors of Washington State and these developers. So that's where we're at right now. We just finished a major teacher strike too in Tacoma, Washington, just south of Seattle, where uh, you know tens of thousands of school kids started the year late uh, because. Uh, the teachers went on strike, and part of it was there were complaints about uh, not feeling that their that the teachers union uh, members were being uh, protected health wise on the job site. So that was one of the the major sticking issues there. But they were able to uh, get an agreement a few weeks ago to get the kids back um, to school in Tacoma. So that's the latest. This is Mark Taylor Canfield reporting from. There you go, Salish our live uh, intrepid Seattle. reporter there in the two hundred six. Hey, let me ask you. Um, are there many places? I know that the city of SeaTac and I think later the city of Seattle went to fifteen dollars an hour. But how many uh, are, is the entire state of Washington at fifteen dollars an hour now? Uh, well, the first of all, the fifteen dollars an hour minimum wage um, campaign was uh, centered in Seattle. So Seattle right. is where it's in effect, and there are efforts to do it statewide. However, there's also the the uh, the phase in period where small businesses. So there's a lag time, and in the city of Seattle for small businesses, that was one of the compromises that sh- um, uh, Democratic Socialist Alternative uh, Socialist uh, Shama Sawant made during the negotiations on the $15 an hour minimum wage campaign after it was successful in SeaTac, Washington, where the SeaTac International Airport is looking at sale to Tacoma International Airport. Uh, so they were successful down there getting the airport workers $15 an hour. She wanted to do that in Seattle. So she brought that campaign up here after working with them in SeaTac. And, you know, we have a city council member who actually works as an activist in other cities, it's really funny. But, you know, she sees that as a, a long-term agenda, a lot of these issues. So she knows that it has to start in the grassroots. And then it went national. So major cities across the United States, including Boston, have a $15 an hour minimum wage uh, initiative. Um, San Francisco definitely has that going on. Los Angeles, a lot of other cities. I just worry, Jeff, you know, there's a lot of... Um, I think Joe Sandberg might say the same thing right after hearing him, is that I'm just worried that by the time it's actually instituted in these cities across the country, and, you know, kudos to Sawan and all the rest of the the unions and the SEIU and all the other unions uh, who really pushed for that in the Northwest to get it to become a national movement. But um, I just worried that by the time it's actually instituted across the country that we're going to need, you know, $25, $28, $30 an hour because uh, it won't keep up with the inflation and the cost of living. Um, so, you know, it, it's an issue. I think even um, uh, we're very proud of the fact that the $15 an hour movement uh, has gone national, but I think we actually need more now. And, you know, with all this talk uh, with, uh, you know, the, the infrastructure program and Build Back Better and all of that, um, and Pramila Jayapal, our congresswoman out there, you know, really fighting with the progressives. And Fantastic saying, you know, work. No, we're not going to compromise on this. I think, you know, these kinds of infrastructure issues and wage issues are going to continue to be a, uh, a problem and going to be continue and housing, affordable housing is going to continue to be an issue in Seattle for sure. These issues are not going away. 
We're uh, speaking Rick with Rick. Actually, that's the next. Yeah, that's that's, that's another piece thing. of the puzzle that is there. Let me ask you this, yeah. Mark. Uh, I know so many things that started there with the marijuana initiatives, of course, legalization, uh, the CTAC, as I said, with the fifteen dollars minimum wage. I mean, is there is something next that is Sawant working on that is going to, you know, really start another revolution of sorts uh, in the country? Because Seattle is sort of the well, it's kind of a new California. You know, you start everything in California. You know, from the from the 1960s of the hula hoop to the you know uh, convertible cars and everything else that have happened uh, in California that all goes east. Seattle now has kind of taken over that role, and I know San Francisco doesn't like that. They don't like the competition um, of being the creative uh, hotspot or whatever. But you know, does Seattle look that way at itself? You know, as has sort of like, you know, we begin things here because you really have. Yeah, in the in the music industry and in, I think, social activism and politics, especially when it becomes when it comes to uh, green issues, environmental issues and also social issues like minimum wage and rent control. I think, you know, some might uh, accuse us of being, you know, a, a more democratic socialist kind of area, but. Call it what you want. I'm not a big fan of labels, but, um, you know, I don't think Pramila Jayapal is either, right? I think she just calls it like it is. And if it's the working class and the poor that are being stiff, then she's going to, like, she's going to speak out against it. Yeah, um, she should. And she does a great do job at it. Cutting, yeah, we have a cutting edge sort of technological and um, software and medical kind of attitude here. There's a lot of research going on on cutting edge science. So we also have that kind of cutting edge politics so it is true and we talk about that a lot and by the way i should give a shout out to the seattle star and omar wiley over there who's who are covering a lot of these issues and they really are and and i write for them too so there's my disclaimer but they they do a lot of good stuff um in covering these really cutting edge issues and when you have politicians like shama sawan carmilla jayapal we have um, probably nikita oliver is going to be a new city council member who's a member of the people's party who's who's definitely considers herself on the left these people, I think, are going to make a difference, and there's enough support here and, and a, you know, steady support, even with the corporatization and the high rents. By the way, yeah, we're in competition with San Francisco also for who has the highest rents on the West Coast. So, <laughs> unfortunately, that's not a competition I wanted to see, but that's what happens when major corporations move to your area. Yes, they bring lots of jobs, which is great. It's great. A lot of people get jobs at Amazon or whatever in Seattle, but you know what? Is it really worth um, the skyrocketing real estate, the cost of real estate, and the skyrocketing rents, and the problems with homelessness and poverty? You know, I think these major corporations owe us a little bit more than to just come in and be corporate raiders and, you know, take what they can and then get out of Dodge or whatever. It's just, you know, I'm tired of this Wild West frontier-style capitalism. We really need to be responsible for the footprint that you leave in the communities where you do business, everyone. That includes the small business owners who are usually in Seattle pretty good at being a part of the community and interacting with people, although unfortunately some of them have gone under during the pandemic and also because of the pressure from major corporate headquarters being built here. But uh, g- good news is that bands like the Black Tones and very Yeah, well, and and I was going to ask you about that because, uh, you know, they're a very political band, as you say. Uh, and yeah. that, to me, is an important piece of how, you know, a lot of it continues. You know, you think about the punk movement both in San Francisco, and we got to get our friend uh, Lincoln Mitchell back on one of these days. We wrote about a lot about San Francisco and a third place baseball team, punk rock, and Harvey Milk and all that uh, back in the '70s. But now Seattle has kind of taken over that role of music. We you mentioned earlier Nirvana and and Soundgarden, and of course our, our friends um, at Pearl Jam. And I, I just think about you know the the role in which that. Ban- those bands and their political views really changed a lot of uh, music. And of course, you know, today you're talking to me about the Black Tones. So one of these days, you got to get me some uh, some music, and we'll throw that into our uh, uh, into our mix here on the Jeff Santo Show. I'm fascinated to see how they continue to to grow in popularity. There, the Black Tones. We're here on the Jeff Santo Show talking with Mark Taylor Canfield, who is uh, broadcasting live from uh, the Puget Sound. Yeah, no, I was saying that uh, it's been a really great thing to see Mike McCready, guitarist for Pearl Jam, supporting the Black Tones, their 7-inch vinyl that uh, Jack Endino produced, who's somebody I've hung out with and is a great guy. He is the first 
He's the guy who produced the first Nirvana album. His name is Jack Andino. He's kind of a local legend here. He's also a guitarist in like five different bands, but that's typical for Seattle. But um, yeah, Mike McCready has been in, um, supporting them. We've had, you know, like Chris Thale from Soundgarden stepped out in support of Shana Shepard and Bear Axe, which is another great local band. So these are the names that people should know about. Um, these are the new names. These are the, the local you know, I know they wouldn't like me to say this, but I kind of call them like the local Beatles, you know, here. They're so popular in Seattle that everybody loves to go to their shows. The Black Tones just played a free show at uh, Pier 62 right down on Elliott Bay on the waterfront. It was a beautiful sunny day. It was a glorious experience. It was like, I don't know. Uh, I mean, the next best thing to uh, what happened there in, <laughs> in, in New York when everybody got together at Woodstock because it was that vibe. It was just really happy and fun. And uh, I've become sort of a local photographer, videographer at these shows. They all, like, uh, let me take photographs and interview the band sometimes, you know, and do video at the show. So I, I feel really honored. Uh, I get press credentials. And then uh, not only am I a rock and roller wearing my Rage Against the Machine T-shirt or whatever like I am today, but I also get to go out there and uh, cover the arts and culture. And that's a really beautiful thing, too, because I know these people personally. I've been on the same stage with them. You know, the Black Tones invited me up on stage with them when they play the free KEXP shows a couple of years ago at the Mural Amphitheater, the best place in Seattle to play underneath the Space Needle. Um, they have been, you know, political. They have a song about um, police killing black men across the country. They don't hold back on that. But they're not necessarily a really angry band like the Dead Kennedys or something. I think the spirit of the band is very much peaceful and loving. Of course, they are very much in support of the Black Lives uh, Matter movement. Um, and I think, you know, they are using their voices for change, just like... Tom Morello and Rage Against the Machine, who I've also met, and Dave Grohl, who's got his new book out called The Storyteller, so he's doing this virtual um, book tour, but he's really inspiring me because I've met a lot of really interesting and famous people in rock and roll and politics, too, and I kind of want to do the same thing he's doing and just write a book because I have so many stories, as you know. I've hung out with Jello Biafra and Tom Morello and interviewed Buffy St. Marie and some people from the 60s and stuff who were still doing really cool stuff. But right now in Seattle, I think the best thing going on is this, and I will, it's, you'll hear it here first, folks. It isn't even being covered really by Rolling Stone, although NPR kind of looked into it. Um, first of all, all the concerts in Seattle require proof of vaccination or a negative test with a mask for entry. But actually, testing is really hard to get right now because of uh, a high demand. And also, all indoors bars and restaurants require the same. But there is a new sound, and it comes from a, an, a, a different, an eclectic series of sources, including Jimi Hendrix, uh, who's also a Seattle native, including the grunge scene and punk, as you mentioned. And I don't know what to call it except to say that it's the Seattle sound, but the Black Tones are one of those bands, and my band happens to fall into this category, too, where we're mixing styles. Some of it's kind of bluesy, like Bear Axe is great. Shana Shepard has an incredible voice. She'll come on stage and do sort of a Billie Holiday sort of bluesy thing, and then they'll go into punk. Um, and they're all wow. very community oriented. They're kind of, you know, the antithesis of rock stars. They don't drive around in their fancy cars and show off. What they are is they're really involved in the community because they pay, they play a lot of benefit concerts to raise money for homeless shelters. I remember a show years ago, a house party where the Black Tones were playing, uh, to raise money for a homeless shelter. And here we have a seaplane, Jeff. I'm going to, oh, another, another seaplane. Oh my God. Oh, we're going to have to talk over that one. Uh, talking with the great Mark Taylor Canfield here on the Jeff Santo Show. And, um, you know, folks, uh, it is uh, so great to, to have uh, MTC in the water with us. Uh, you know, he seems like almost every Friday he is uh, on the water, and it's, uh, it's just so great to do it. Um, Mark, are you back there with us? Yeah, you know, in Seattle, when it's sunny, especially in October, you get your butt out there and you get on the water or go jogging or biking or something. Go to an outdoor restaurant or bar or something because we know that we're going to get a lot of rainy skies. And then you can work on your great American novel or, you know, your new album like <laughs> I am. Uh, you have plenty of time for that. You won't be distracted. It's not like living in Southern California when every day I got up and it was 75 degrees and I wanted to be out at the beach. I became such a beach bum there. In Seattle, you can do it, but you have to pick and choose. And also, the weather is incredibly unpredictable here, and I've been reporting about this on Facebook and other places where you literally have to check the weather report in the Puget Sound or in this part of the Puget Sound every hour. Hey, let me uh, talk about Facebook, report. Mark. Uh, I'm going to interrupt you, but uh, obviously a lot yeah. of explosion on that topic. Any, any, uh, any effect in, uh, in the Seattle WA area? 
Well, oh, here we have another seaplane. These are actually seaplanes that are not um, landing. They're getting ready to take off. So this one probably won't be quite as loud. No. But, um, yes, there is there is because Facebook has a presence in Seattle. Another corporation that does that nobody talks about is Expedia. They've also moved their headquarters here. So Facebook um, quite a, bit a big of footprint in Seattle. And everything that happens to Facebook, of course, is going to affect what, you know, especially the people who work. Uh, for Facebook in Seattle. But, uh, yeah, I just wanted everybody to know, though, that there's a new sound in Seattle, and it's you haven't heard about it yet. Rolling Stone hasn't really quite caught on, but it has to do with the Black Tones and Therax and the, the Martial Law Band is another band that's doing this, Blood Moon Orchestra, General Mojos. There's a lot of really great bands in Seattle that are doing this new Seattle sound, is what I would call it, Jeff. And it's not grunge, although it all has... Um, elements uh, of it back to grunge. Everybody it, you talk to, if you talk to Eva, she'll tell you that she's very much influenced by the grunge rock movement. So her album, the first album, was called Cornbread and Cobain because <laughs> she actually was a kid. Does she like cornbread? South. Because that's important. I love she cornbread. She was from the south. Her mom and her, oh, kid, there and her, you go. Kid, her twin brother, who's the drummer in the band, uh, lived in the south and they ate cornbread listening to Nirvana and then they moved to Seattle and now they're doing the music they always dreamed of and that's why I moved here I moved to Seattle because you can get up on those same stages play the same clubs where your heroes have played and we definitely have some major heroes here Pearl Jam has been one for a long time and they really set the standard for what it's like to really take care of your community and try to be responsible and help out other bands and raise money for uh, good causes. The Black Tones currently are raising money for the Rain City Artist Fund, and what it is is it's a fund that artists have set up to help musicians and other folks who have really struggled over the last year or so um, in getting an income. And so, what it is is it's a fund to try to help pay for musicians' health care and other things like that. So, a very, very good thing and a great standard for you know what what bands should be doing. No doubt. Hey, i uh, just got a couple of minutes left here, Mark. Uh, I wanted to congratulate your Mariners on a really great season. Uh, you know, I know it was tough uh, to watch uh, them on Sunday not get uh, into the playoffs, but a gallant uh, effort to do just that all the way to the last day of the season. And I have a feeling that you guys are going to be a playoff team uh, over the next uh, few years. And it's a young stars you know, I mean, um, uh, it, it was it was really fantastic. I hope you re-signed Seager. You got uh, Lewis coming back from an injury. Uh, uh, Hanniger is a great player, and, and and so on and so forth. So uh, good for you uh, on the baseball front, and your Kraken start up soon too, right? Yes. Uh, so we have the Seahawks, the Mariners, and the Kraken all gearing up at the same time. So a lot of sports activity, a lot of people walking around town with their jerseys, you know, so it, showing local uh team loyalty um and yeah so it's you know a lot of a lot of russell wilson jerseys around it was it was kind of heartbreaking with the mariners but i keep saying that you know um we're tired of being a farm team for the new york yankees (laughs) for getting all of our superstar you know hall of fame players so uh including rodriguez and you know yeah 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 enough of that you know we we beat the yankees the other day by the way we beat the evil empire in boston once they get a taste of that kind of success they have such incredible loyalty here from their fans that people are going to show up at their games whether they win or lose because people love the mariners no matter what but once they start winning and getting that that really you know like champion spirit i I watch out because they might get addicted to it and then they don't want to go back to the old days yeah. Now, Nintendo has owned the team and other rich companies, so they have plenty of money. Yeah, they do. And your Kraken yeah. start on October 12th, I think, in uh, in Vegas. So go Kraken. Hey, uh, we got to run, my friend. Check us, uh, check Can out Mark go? Taylor Canfield on Friday, and of course, Democracy Watch News on YouTube too. And uh, hey, Mark, uh, enjoy your weekend, my man. Yeah, check out my um, Mother of Freedom at YouTube and SoundCloud. And then Eva Walker on KEXP. She has her own show called Audio Oasis where she plays local bands. See you, Jeff. Have a great weekend. You too, man. Have yourself a great one. I want to thank Ron Kreider for producing this broadcast. I want to thank you for listening, folks. Keep on fighting peacefully. A happy birthday to Harvey K. tomorrow. And for you, have yourself a great weekend, folks. My name is Jeff Santos, and it is now my time to say I gotta go. Yeah.
With SRN News, I'm Keith Peters in Washington. Russian authorities have labeled nine more journalists and three media organizations as foreign agents. Part of official efforts to sideline critics just as a Russian journalist won the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize. Dmitry Muratov and fellow journalist Maria Ressa of the Philippines won the prize Friday for their fight for freedom of expression. Many in Russia had hoped that the award would restrain the authorities' crackdown on critical media outlets. But hours after the prize announcement, Russia's Justice Ministry added another nine journalists and three entities to its lists of foreign agents, a label that carries strong pejorative connotations and implies increased official scrutiny. On Wall Street, the Dow down by eight points. The Nasdaq dropped 74. The S&P 500 lower by eight. Crude oil up to 79.48 a barrel. This is SRN News.